Okay, so are there any questions before we begin? Fantastic. Okay, so this week uh, we delve into continuous random variables. So already we've uh, learned how to deal with discrete random variables and their probability distributions. And more specifically, the two that we use in this uh, class are the binomial and the poisson, or as people say, the poison. Uh, those are the two you know, main discrete random variable distributions. When you start talking about continuous random variables and their probability distributions, then it, it's really, it's all about the normal distribution and the student's T-curve. And the T-curve is really identical to the normal. It's got the same shape. Uh, the only difference is the T distribution is a little shorter and then it has little fatter tails. The tails are, are thicker. So there's, there's more data out in the tails than there is uh, in the normal distribution. I know we discussed um, the empirical rule before, right? Where we have 68, uh, 95 and 99.7. Well, with the, um, uh, the student T, all of those numbers are less. You know, there's like 60, you know, 85 and like 92 or something, I'm, you know, and then the rest is in the tails. And th that's for smaller sets. The, the student T curve, or what they just call the, the T distribution, it will actually morph into the normal distribution as your sample sizes get larger. Um, and in fact, the idea is if you if you let your sample size go to infinity, the T curve actually becomes the normal curve. So that's how strongly related um, those two curves are. So anything we we talk about in terms of the normal curve, it's the same really concept as the as the T curve. And what happens is in in practice and in application, we use the T curve whenever we're uh, dealing with uh, trying to figure out something about a mean of our sample, right, an average of our sample, and we don't know the standard deviation of the population that we sampled from, which is 99% of the time. So in reality, whenever you're doing, um, did all of you lose me? Cecily's saying she can't hear me. Nope, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I can hear you. Thank yep, you. Let good. me just tell her. Yep, we got gotcha. you. Okay, um, so as I was saying that um, in practice, we almost always use the T-curve whenever we have to do any kind of analysis of the mean. So if you want to um, do a confidence interval of your sample mean, you're gonna use the T-curve to calculate that because you're most likely not going to know the standard deviation of the population you're sampling from. We, we very rarely know standard deviations of, of populations. It's just, it's very, very rare. But that being said, that doesn't mean that the normal curve isn't important because the normal curve is what allows us to do hypothesis tests. All hypothesis tests are built on basically the foundation of what the normal curve is and how it works. Okay, we've said this before, right? Continuous random variables um, are basically results that you get from an experiment, you know, or a survey question or whatever it is. It's you, if you gather data and that data comes in from a measurement, then that's considered a continuous random variable, i.e. the, you know, the thing that got the data, right? So if you ask a question, that's considered your variable because then the answers are all the different um, values that that quote unquote variable can take on, right? If you run an experiment, then the experiment is the variable and all the different results that you can get from that experiment are the quote unquote random, right? Numbers or results that you get for that variable. So we call it a variable because the results you can get can vary, right? Um, so that's where a lot of students get confused with this whole idea of well, what the hell is the variable? Well, the variable is, is literally just the data that you're getting 
and it's the name that you give to the data. So this set of data is called heights. Okay, then the random variable is height. This set of data is called weights. Okay, then the random variable is weight. It, I mean, it's that simple, right? So don't don't overthink it. Don't read too much into why we call it a continuous random variable. What's important is thinking about the distribution that comes from a continuous random variable. Any continuous random variable will have a continuous probability distribution. It will have some sort of smooth curve and the area under that curve represents probability. And just like with the, um, you know, the discrete curves where we had probability of, you know, five or probability of four or probability of five and less, the same kind of idea happens here, only now we can no longer do equals. We can no longer ask the probability of something equaling three because in order to find probability you have to have area and area has to have both a height and a width and if you're saying something equals a specific x value then you're looking for all of the area in the curve above that x value and there is no area because it's just a thin line so that brings us to this idea that we can only find probability if we have an interval, right? So we can find the probability that our random variable will um, result in an answer that's in this range, right? It's between two numbers. Or we could also obviously say that X is going to be less than a certain number because then the range just becomes that number and then all the way down to negative infinity or zero, depending on um, you know what kind of uh, variable you're using, you know, because most of these variables, uh, the bottom is zero, right? Like you can't have heights that are less than zero. You can't have weights that are less than zero. You can't have the length of a lifespan of a product that's less than zero, right? So most of these things, the, the bottom end is zero. So it just goes below that up to zero or down to zero. And then you could also, of course, have greater than, which in that case does go up to infinity, unless there is some sort of, you know, obvious higher end, you know, like heights, I think the tallest man ever recorded was like seven feet 11 or something like that, you know, and then um, the, the weights, the heaviest person I think ever, you know, has been like 900 pounds or something like that. So there are, you know, limits to these things, but technically in theory, they go on forever. Okay, so just remember, we can no longer do probability of X equaling a value that is always zero. And what that tells us then is there is absolutely no difference between the probability that X is greater than or equal to A, and it goes all the way, or just the probability that X is greater than A. Because adding in that equals part doesn't add any extra uh, probability because equals is zero, right? So whether it's a strictly greater than, a strictly less than, or less than or equals or greater than or equals, all those things don't matter. Um, you know, it, you're going to get the same answer either way, which is why in a lot of, um, well, I shouldn't say in a lot of, but if you go to certain sites that will do these types of probabilities for you, my favorite being StatCrunch, and you go to the normal calculator, you'll see that the options it gives you for doing probabilities is only less than or equal or greater than or equal doesn't even have the less than or the greater than options because they don't make any differences. Whereas if you open up the binomial, you can see its options are, right? Less than or equal, greater than or equal, less than, greater than, and equals because it's discrete, right? So equals matters. So all of these actually give you different things, right? Being less than or equal to five gives you that but being strictly less than five no longer includes five and, and ergo you get a different result. Whereas here it doesn't even give you that option. Okay, so just keep that in mind that um, equals don't exist, right? We can no longer take the, the probability of it equaling something. So it's always gonna be an inequality of some sort, a less than, a greater than, or an in-between. We can do these things in SAS very easily. I showed you this code before. It's in um, our SAS how-to, right? Under week five, we've got our normal probabilities down here. So here's the CDF. Um, then we've got the uh, the quantile, 
which is basically the uh, inverse function, you'll notice that there is no PDF version of the probability because PDF, remember, gives you pr precise probability. It's the it's probability of x equaling something, whereas the CDF is the probability that x is less than or equal to a certain amount. And the PDF doesn't exist for normal because we can't do that because it's no longer a discrete curve. Why is the one XMS and the other is XUS? Uh, which two are you talking about? In the um, probability equals PDF normal XMS? Yes. The one in the PowerPoint said XUS. What, what does well, that mean? Either, you, either way, but what? M stands for mean. So okay. in this, the code is M for mean. In the oh, PowerPoint, okay. they're just using U because it looks like the Greek letter mu, oh, yeah. which means number mean, mean and standard yeah, deviation. Exactly. Okay. And technically, with these codes, you could rename this. If you just make this U and this U, the function still works. Because it's literally just saying you're defining these uh, letters to be this, and then you're going to run it on those letters. You could also just get rid of these three lines and just put your three numbers in separated by commas. We just have it here to remind us what all those numbers mean. The first number is the value that you're testing against. The second number is the mean of the distribution. The third number is the standard deviation of the distribution. So um, it doesn't matter what uh, letter you use, just as long as they match. Great question. OK. Uh, what else do we have? Um, special version of the normal curve normal distribution called the normal uh, standard normal. The standard normal distribution <clears throat> just means that it's been standardized. It's been standardized to have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of zero, sorry, a standard deviation of one, which is what like this thing defaults to. The reason why we, we have that is um, it's the idea of being able to standardize different things. So for instance, um, let's say you were looking at two different uh, test scores. You were looking at a, a group of kids that took one test and another group of kids that took another test. The example I like to use a lot are the SATs versus the ACTs. You know, those are both tests that get you into college. But those two tests are on two completely different scales, right? The SAT, well, last time I checked, I thought it was uh, back up to out of 2200 or something at first it was 16 then it went to 24 and then it went back down to 16 i don't know where that what the hell the scale is now but it's in the hundreds of something and the act the scale is uh like 36 or 38 somewhere around there is is you know like considered 100 percent so obviously you can't just go, hey, this kid got a score of 32. This kid got a score of 1500. Uh, 1500 is better than 32. Well, not necessarily, right? You got to figure out how 1500 relates to the rest of the test scores. So you can um, calculate what are called Z scores. Z coming from the normal curve. And what you would do is you standardize it so that the average is zero and the mean is one. So when you get a Z score of one, that means the score that you had on your test is exactly one standard deviation above the mean. Or a Z score of two means you're exactly two standard deviations above the mean. So now you can compare and contrast two different things because you can take that score of 1500, you can calculate its Z score, and let's say it comes out to you know 2.3, then you take the score of 35 and you calculate its Z score and it comes out to 3.1. Well, 3.1 is bigger than 2.3. So that means they scored better, right? Because they're higher up on the scale. They're further above the mean, which means they did better than all of their peers on that test. And then they'll also do corresponding percentiles. And a percentile just means the percentage of area below it. And we, we know that obviously if you score at two, Right. This is remember the empirical rule. If we're plus or minus two, this is 95% of the data. So there's only 5% in the two tails. So there's two and a half here and two and a half here. So a Z score of two is basically the 97th and a half percentile, right? Because there's only two and a half percent above and the other 97 and a half percent is below. <clears throat> so you can also report them as percentiles, which is a lot easier for the regular person to understand. Okay. 
Values of z to the left of center are obviously negative, and values of z to the right of center are obviously positive, and the total area is always one. That's the same for all probability distributions. You can use SAS to calculate these things. You can do this normal data normal, and it basically tells SAS that we're doing a normal curve. You can look for the prob you know, all the stuff that's below 1.36, well, all you're doing is by setting it up with a zero and a one for your mean and your standard deviation, you're turning this into what's called the standard normal instead of just any old normal. <clears throat> and then you can figure out, for instance, what percentile the kid was in who got a z-score you know, of 2.32 and what percentile the kid was in who got a z-score of you know, 3.1 and those kinds of things by just simply running this. And when you do the CDF, it's the area below, which is the same thing as a percentile. Okay, questions so far on what we've covered? Okay, one thing to remember, just like when we're dealing with the binomial and the Poisson distribution before, is if we need to find area above, then we always have to you know, run the CDF and then do one minus it because one minus is the only way to get above because remember the CDF is always area below. So it's always area to the left. And then of course, if you need to get area in between, you have to run it twice and take the difference because if you do the CDF of 1.36, it'll be all of the area. Then if you do the CDF of negative 1.2, it'll do this area to the left. And if you take you know, the big area minus the small area, you're left with the area in between. If you have um, a TI graphing calculator, the fancy one, then you can simply just, you know, do the between as a between because it just asks for uh, lower value and upper value. And same, you know, with things like StatCrunch here, if you click on the between button, you could just put in your low value and your high value and it'll give you area in between. But that, of course, requires you to have you know, those pieces of technology. If we're going to deal with just SAS, we can deal with just SAS. And same thing with Excel. Excel has no way of doing the between. You have to, you have to run the equals norm.dist function, and, and then it goes, gives you the CDF stuff all the way to the left. Right? Then you run it again on the other number, and it gives you the other piece. And then you subtract one from the other, and, and there you go. You've got the in-between. Okay, um, so here's a simple example. We're told that X has a normal probability distribution with a mu of five and a sigma of two. Because these are Greek letters, we now know that this is the mean of the population. This is the standard deviation of the population. That's why we would use the normal curve and not the T curve. And then they want us to find the probability of X greater than seven. This basically just means that Whatever the scenario is, let's say, um, well, uh, because it has to be continuous, it can't be, you know, like number of times people eat out because that's a counting kind of thing. Um, but for, for something, you get a mean of five, and right? So um, uh, I don't know what the hell I could measure that would give me a mean of five. But anyhow, this is asking that if you go and run that experiment one more time, so like if you ask one more person the same question, if, if you got this data from a survey, then what's the probability that their answer is going to be greater than seven? And by the way, if their answer being greater than or equal to seven would be the exact same answer, right? It'd be, we do the exact same stuff. <clears throat> we set it at seven. We set the mean and the standard deviation. We run the CDF. We get the probability of 0.84. Remember, that's the probability that it's seven or smaller. So now we do one minus it, and it gives us the probability of being seven or greater. You'll notice that it's not like the binomial where to be, if we wanted to be greater than or equal to seven, we would still do this, and we would subtract the stuff that is less than or equal to seven, and it would give us the leftover would be greater than or equal to seven. You're thinking, well, how can that be? How can equal to seven be below and equal to seven be above? And the answer is, remember, equal to seven means zero. So it really technically doesn't exist in either question, right? 
So we don't have to do that kind of adjustment like we did with the binomial, where if we wanted everything greater than seven, for instance, and it was a binomial, we would have to run the CDF on six, remember, because that would give us zero through six. <clears throat> then we would subtract that from one, and that would give us everything that was seven or above if we wanted to be greater or equal to seven. If we want to be strictly greater than seven, then we'd run the CDF on seven. It would take seven and, uh, and below above, and we'd be left with just strictly greater than seven. We don't have to worry about doing those adjustments with the normal curve. All right, here's another simple <clears throat> example. The, nor the, the mean is one, standard deviation is 0.1. They wanna know if you, you know, pick a burger at random, what's the probability that its weight is between 0.8 and 0.85. And you would simply run the normal on 0.85 CDF, give you all the area all the way down, then run it on 0.8, which give you your area in the tail. You would take the difference of those two. So here's for 0.85, here's for 0.8, take the difference. And there's only a 4% chance that it's gonna be that small, which is good because I sure as hell wouldn't wanna you know, buy this thing and get you know cheaped out because it's supposed to be getting a pound and I'm only getting 0.85. <clears throat> okay. How about what is the weight of a package such that only 1% of all packages exceed this weight? You can see how this is a different question. And this is what I consider kind of the backwards question. Instead of here's a value, here's a value for X, tell me how much area is under the curve to one side of it, right? We're either gonna find something below X, above X, or in between X and another number. We're now going at it backwards and we're saying, hey, we don't know what X is, but we do know that the area under the curve that we're looking for is only 1%. And we want to find the cutoff value that gives us that. Well, I always recommend that if you're struggling with these concepts at all, the first thing you always do is draw a simple picture like this. Just give yourself a simple bell curve. You want to find a cutoff, right? You want to find an X value that has only 1% of the packages above it. So you, so, you know, exceeding it, you know that that means 1% is above. So you kind of shade in the little tail, say that's 1%, and you know that this little X that you're looking for has 99% below it. <clears throat> and the reason why we did that is because, just like the CDF function, this quantile function, which if you've ever worked with Excel, if you've been doing any of these in Excel, it's the same thing as the inverse norm function in Excel. It's, and it's basically just the inverse of the normal function. Instead of you giving it an X value and it giving you a probability, you give it a probability and it gives you an X value. You see how it's kind of like we've turned, we've turned the function around. It's going in the opposite direction. So we need to tell it what's the probability and the probability is always as a decimal and it's always the equivalent of the area to the left, right? So just like a CDF, it's the probability of things being less than or equal to, right? Below it to the left. Then we have to put in the mean and the standard deviation. In this case, um, we're still using the same information from the previous pay, uh, slide, which told us that the mean of, of burgers was one pound and the standard deviation was 0.1 of a pound. Then we run this simple quantile function where it just takes that and it, it runs it backwards and it spits out this value and it tells us it's 1.23, which seems too small to me, but... <clears throat> Here it says 2.33. This could be a, a typo. I'm not really sure. I'd have to ask you why am I wondering. Let's run it here. A mean of 1, standard deviation of 0.1. We want the area to be uh, 0.01 above. Yeah, it is 1.23. Okay. Okay, um, the normal approximation of the binomial is really stupid. I don't know why we still teach this because why would you approximate something when you can actually get the full answer from the binomial? But it still exists as a concept. And, and really what I want you to glean from the concept is this picture right here, that you're, you're basically fitting a normal curve to the binomial and you're using it to approximate it. And you can see that it's an okay approximation, but it's not great. Um, it gets better and better and better as n gets larger and larger and larger. Oh, that's fantastic. There we go. 
things that you have to make sure before you can um, use the approximation is you want to make sure to include the entire rectangle for all the values of x that are in the intervals that you're looking for. And this is called the continuity of correction. And then you want to standardize those values of x. What the hell does that mean? Well, if, you're, if your binomial question was, what's the probability that x is less than 4? Then when you run the normal curve, you would adjust it to 3.5. Because you want x less than 4. So you only want, the first bar you want is the bar for 3. Right? You only want the bar for 3. You don't want the bar that represents 4. So if you set the normal curve, if on the normal curve you looked for all the area less than 4, which remember is technically less than or equal to 4, that's going to give you a lot of the area in the, um, the bar for 4 that you don't want. So you set it to 3.5, and, and that just that captures just the bar for 3 and everything below it. More or less, it's it's not a perfect system. Um, <clears throat> again, this is an approximation, but the idea is you always take a half step up or down, depending on if you're doing a greater than or less than, and it just gives you a, a more accurate estimate. It's still stupid. It's still a crappy thing to do. It's still something that you would never do in the real world. This is just a learning tool. It's just a way for students to then be able to see through the numbers how the binomial and normal curve are similar to each other and then you know how they're different. So we're going to do you know a couple examples here and there's actually a, a question or two in the homework that asks you to approximate things with the normal curve. Just know that you would never ever ever do this for real because like I said before why would you want to get an approximate answer when you could just get the precise answer using the binomial. Okay, here's our typical example. Suppose x now is a binomial random variable instead of a continuous random variable. Your sample size is 30. Your probability of a success is 40%. We can use the normal approximation to find the probability that x is less than or equal to 10. The first thing we have to calculate is the mean and the standard deviation of our binomial curve using these simple formulas that we saw last week. The mean is just n times p, so 30 times 0.4 is 12, and the standard deviation is just the square root of npq. Remember, q is just the complement of p, so we got 30 times 0.4 times 0.6, that gives us 2.683. And once we have that bit of information, we can put the 12, the 2.683, into our normal CDF. We want um, <clears throat> the question that they asked for was a less than or equal to, so we don't have to worry about one minus. But since we're doing less than or equal to 10, we have to go up a step, right? We have to go up to 10 and a half to make sure we capture that entire 10 um, bar, because each bar is basically centered on the number. So this bar is centered on 10. So if we started our normal curve at 10, we would only get half of that bar. And since we wanted the full 10 bar, right, because we want x is less than or equal to 10, we bump this up to 10 and a half, which makes it wide enough that it should pretty much capture this entire bar. And then we get this answer of 0.288. And of course, we could, we could just run the binomial and see how close they are. And they'll be close-ish because n being 30 is a fairly decent sample size. But it's, like I said, still it's a silly thing to do. OK, <clears throat> the central limit theorem, very important. This is something that students mess up all the time. When we're doing these normal curve calculations, you know, like figuring out the problem. So now we're back to the normal curve. We're not doing this whole binomial crap. We're just working on the normal curve. <clears throat> and we want to find the probability, you know, that if we pick one thing at random, it's less than this, or we pick one thing at random, and it's greater than this, or we pick one thing at random, it's in between these two things. That's fine. But what happens if we want to go out and pick five things and ask the question, what's the average, what's the probability that the average of those five things is less than something or greater than something or in between something? Well, the nice thing about the normal curve is it's still theoretically the same question. It's still 
lives on a perfectly normal distribution. The only difference is when our sample now has a size of five instead of a size of one, the standard deviation of our normal curve that we're testing on becomes the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of five. So the central limit theorem basically just tells us that whenever we're taking a sample of things and calculating these probabilities on the average of that entire sample, we have to do this slight adjustment of the standard deviation. And all that is, is we take the standard deviation of the population and divide it by the square root of our sample size. So if we want to find the average of five things, we're dividing by the square root of five. If we want to find the average of 20 things, we're dividing by the square root of 20. And in fact, the central limit theorem works all the time because if we have a sample size of one, we're taking the population standard deviation and we're dividing by the square root of one. And we all know the square root of one is one. So when we divide by one, it doesn't change, which is you know what we were doing all along. So the central limit there, and we've actually been doing it all along. We were just doing it for a sample size of one. And of course, a sample size of one doesn't do anything mathematically because when you divide by the square root of one, you're not dividing by anything other than one. I say all that to point out the fact that the central limit theorem is a complete theorem. It works for all sample sizes. It's just when we have a sample size of one, we don't bother to do this math because it becomes a trivial waste of time. Here's a simple example. So tires last 20,000 miles on average with a standard deviation of 3,500 miles. What is the probability that if you take a sample of 70 tires, that that sample would have a mean that is less than 19,500. Okay, well, we have the population mean of 20,000. We have the population standard deviation of 3,500. We have to divide that by the square root of our sample size of 70, which gives us this fun little decimal. And if we put all of that into our um, SAS formula, it's going to give us a probability of you know basically 11.6%. The nice thing about this is you don't actually have to do this math. Um, SAS does square roots. You could, in, in the formula, just do square root. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, open up. A simple bar <clears throat> chart. And edit that bad boy so I can get me some code. Okay. Now, we've got our normal curve here, our normal code, I should say. All right, if we just run this as it is, you'll see that we'll just get a probability. And that's if we have a mean of 250, a standard deviation of 50, and we're looking for 350, this is giving us the probability that we're less than or equal to, or just strictly less than, and both those questions are the same. It's 97%. Okay, we go back to our code now. And now we could do SQRT of 50. And what this does is this, this actually calculates the square root of 50. Right, and remember, it was it, our original one was 50. So this is 50 divided by the square root of 50. If this is where our sample size, let's say our sample size was, uh, let's say our sample size was 25, because that way we can do the math and we know what it is, right? Square root of 25 is five. So this should really be 50 divided by five. This should just be 10. 10. See that? Hee <laughs> hee. So you don't have to do those calculations yourself. You can just let um, SAS do it by just doing SQRT in parentheses and that does the square root. Okay, so it's a nice little shortcut. You don't have to worry about, um, you know, doing this stuff in a calculator and possibly, you know, getting it wrong or, or then taking this and typing it in and, you know, fat. Dr. Fingers. McPrite. Yes. Um, for the homework, which question would that be equivalent to? Um, it's showed. later on in the homework where they have the sample size one. So let's see. It's, um, Da, 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 da. One, two, three, binomial using normal. I thought it was later on. Maybe I'm wrong. College board. That's one. So 
this one and this one are both singles. That's a single. Here you go. Uh, 79. 79 uses the, um, because it's saying, take a random sample of 20 patients and their mean psychometer, you know, retardation score is obtained. What's the probability that their mean score is between this and this? So you can see how we're, we're asking for what's the probability that the average, right, the mean of a sample of 20 things. So this would be the mean, would, be, would still be 930, but the standard deviation would no longer be 130, it'd be 130 divided by the square root of 20. And that's what you have to do for this one, for 79. And how did you type the square root inside the um and set? Was it SQ RT? SQRT okay. right here. It's Perfect. it's um it's standard code. If you're in a set, if you're in a, sorry, Excel, it's the same thing in Excel. Equals SQRT uh, is the square root in Excel, as well as SAS. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um and that's it, guys. That's been that's really that's all we've got. Um, I think there's a, there might be a z-score question, um, but that's all based on the quantile. So if you need to solve backwards for a z-score, this is hard to see this way. The formula for a z-score is very simple. Your z-score equals your data value minus the mean, which we normally use as a, as a mu, all over the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, right? So that's the, the, the formula that you would need. There's, I think there's one question where you have to solve for the sample size or something in order to keep your z-score at a certain point, or, or you have to solve for the z or something. I can't remember what it is, but there is one question I believe that uses this. So you might want to you know, take note of that one. Okay, questions? All righty. Um, that's it for the theory. Any questions on the homework? <clears throat> if you've taken a look at it. Seth, you're first. Dr. McBride, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I was hoping to go over 4.65C. Yes. I seem to be, I've done it longhand and like looking it up in the table and I've done it in SAS. And I seem to get the exact same answer and it's kind of confusing to me. Okay, because it doesn't seem like it should be right? Yeah, it doesn't seem like it should be right at all. I'm getting um, equal probabilities for uh, y greater than 150 and less than 350. I'm getting 0 0.9772. So oh, for each part? Yeah, so then when I subtract them, I get zero, which- Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's, yeah, you, and you've got a good instinct. So greater than um, 150 is 0.9772 because that's the answer you get for part B. So that part is correct. Your answer for less than uh, 350 is is a problem. Well, here's the thing. This answer of being greater than 150 is not the same thing down here. It's you want the probability that y is you know it's it, it's two parts right. You got to do you got so it, let's run through it. Um, we'll do each one individually. Let me try this. And all right. We've got a mean of 250. Sorry, that's not what we, that's not my mean. We got uh, 350 for X. The mean is 250. The standard deviation is 50. So we can get rid of the square root stuff. And if we run this, so 97725 is the probability of being less than or equal to 350. Now, here's where it gets confusing. I know that you were looking at this and saying, okay, well, the second part is y is greater than 150. Yes, that's true, because we're looking for y to be in between. But the second part that you want to calculate is not 
the answer that you get from B. You want to find the probability that it's less than 150. Because if you look at the picture, so I'll draw a quick picture. Here's your normal curve. And we've got uh, 350 is up here. And then we've got 150 is down here because 250, right, is the middle. And then so yellow. The first one is all of this. That's what we just found over here. That is 0.97725. That's all that area. But now we basically need to find this area and subtract it away. So we're left with just the area in between. So if we go back to our code and just change this to 150 and run it, that is the stuff below it, right? We don't want to do one minus it because we don't want to know the area above it because then that would give us all of this stuff up here. So instead, we want to leave it as it is. And this stuff in here is just the 0 0.022750. So if we take 0.97725, subtract the 0 0.022750 from it, that's going to give us the in-between. That's the answer we're looking for. Does that make more sense, Seth? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, sorry if that slowed everyone else down. No, no, no. I'm sure other people had the exact same question. All right, who's next? I got Kofi. Okay, I've been trying to use uh, all the tools that are available. So if I present my work, you see that I'm using StatCrunch, I'm using SAS. But in 4.65, for example, when I use StatCrunch and SAS, I get different values for that particular question. And I'm wondering what I'm doing wrong and I'm not getting the same answer. For which one, for C? No, B, 4.65B. Okay, so if we, do, if we do it in SAS, right, SAS. we have to do one minus because we're looking for greater than. And we get this answer. Okay, I get it. Because that's what I'm getting on the start crunch. You did, yeah, and you didn't do the one minus, did you? No. Yeah, so you got to remember that in SAS, the CDF always does area to the left. It's always a less than question. So to get a greater than question, you always have to do one minus. Just okay. like we did with the binomials last week um, and the Poisson function, right? Anytime we did the CDFs, it was always giving us a less than or equal to, right? It was always giving us the stuff below it. So if we want the stuff above it, we always have to do one minus. Okay, I got that one. Then I have a second one, if I may. Yeah. Yeah, on 470, I watch one of your videos, but then I, it looks like you use 530 instead of 513. I don't know whether there was something well, wrong with it. It could have been a different question. It was the same question, but I think maybe you must have typed. Uh, I could have been on that as well, too. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, so I'm I was just well trying to check that. if my answers were right with, on the 513, uh, on the 470. Whatever what I'm getting with the start, crunch is correct. What did you get for A? Um, 470, hold on a second. 470. I'm getting a point zero zero one three eight. No. That's so we've got. Um, I had the same kind of thing. Is it point six six nine two? No. For four, we said four seventy, yeah. right? Four seven zero A. Okay. A. Uh, yeah. With SAS, uh, with what's it called? Um, uh, Excel, I'm getting 0.998. No, but with Star Crunch, it's 0 0.0113. No, these are way off. 
Okay. Uh, doctor, doctor so Perry. I did 600 minus 513 divided by 130. Well, got, yeah, if you're if you're trying if you're trying to find the Z score, but you're, they're not asking for the Z score, they're asking for what percentages. They're just asking for probabilities, not Z scores. Be point two five one six. Was it? Is it point two five one six? It sure is. So winner, winner. That's right, chicken dinner. <laughs> Michael's buying drinks. Okay, six hundred is our X because that's the thing that we're concerned with we want greater than so we know it has to be a one minus right because um cdfs always do below so greater than becomes one minus we put in our mean of 513 we put in our standard deviation of 130 and we run it and there it is 25167 can you run that in stat crunch let me see so in stat crunch you put in the mean 513, standard deviation, 130. We want greater than 600, so we just turn this X is greater than 600, 0.25167. It's amazing. That's what mine looks like. <laughs> yes, it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Man. I spent the whole day doing the same thing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah. So that's it, guys. I mean, it's really that simple. Don't overthink it. Greater thans are, I mean, greater thans in stat crunch is easy because you just, you know, you change this from less than to greater thans. But in SAS, all you have to do is slap a one minus, right, in front of the, the CDF to do a greater than. And then less thans, you take it away, right? Less thans are just normal. And then in betweens, you just have to do them in two parts. Um, and, and, you know, here's something that, you know, might seem obvious, but maybe this is going to be one of those V8 moments where you're all slapping yourselves in the head. But if I'm going to do an in-between, I'm just going to run this stupid thing twice at the same time. So I have both of my results right there, you know, and then I can just whip out a calculator and get get the difference right there. So for instance, um, uh, we want the diff in between 600 and 450 is, you know, part D. So I run this, -ding, and it's just that number minus that number. Really simple. I got the hard one, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Very <one>. good. <laughs> All right, Kofi, do you still have a question? I'll come back again. Okay. Micah. Hi, Dr. McBride. Um, my question is still um, 465D. Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I tried to do that by hand, but I wasn't sure. Um, we took, we found for K first, and then we took the, um, the 250 minus the K. Um, to try to figure everything else out and couldn't come to a um, viable solution, <laughs> agreeable <laughs> solution here. But can you show us um, how to do that, please? Yes, absolutely. So here's my normal curve. The, the question that they're asking is they want to find a K such that the probability of 250 minus K and 250 plus K Right, the probability that you're in between that range is going to be 0. 0.6. So basically what's happening is, remember 250 was the average, right? They told us that 250 was the mean. That's your mean. Um, let me double check. I'm not wrong here. I thought that was my mean. Yeah, 250 is my mean. My standard deviation is 50. So we've got a mean of 250 and then we've got a standard deviation of 50. Okay, so they want us to find some distance k. We don't know what it is, but we're going to go equidistance in both directions. And if we do that, all of this in yellow, right? That's going to equal. 
Now, if we went one standard deviation in both directions, right? So if we went up to uh, 300 and down to 200, right? Because standard deviation is 50. So if we go up 50 to 300 and down 50 to 200, that we, so we go one standard deviation in both directions, how much of the area is captured there according to the empirical rule? Very good, Seth. 68%. So we know that K has to at least be less than 50 because we don't want 68%. We only want 60. Okay. Well, we're looking for this K, this value of K right here. Remember that we have two functions that we're working with this, this week. We have the, the normal CDF, which says, hey, you give me an X value, a mean and a standard deviation, I'll tell you how much area is under the normal curve, i.e. I'll give you the probability because area under the normal curve is the same damn thing as probability, right? The, the total area under the curve always equals one. So when we get a, a, a fraction of that area, that's a probability. So the, the normal CDF says, just like with the binomials, you give me a value, you give me a mean, you give me a standard deviation, and I'll spit out a probability. Then we have the inverse norm function, which SAS calls the quantile function. And the quantile function says, hey, I'm going to do that in reverse. Instead of you giving me a data value, a mean, and a standard deviation, and I give you a probability, you give me the probability, the mean and the standard deviation, and I'll spit out the K, right? It does it in reverse. So one function takes K and maps your answer to a probability. Then the inverse function takes that probability and matches it back to the K. So we know that we need to use the inverse function. We need to use the quantile function here to find k. But in order to find k, we have to tell the function three things. We have to give it the mean. We have to give it the standard deviation. Well, we know that, 250 and 50. But we have to give it a probability. And we have to give it the probability to the left of our k. So we need to know how much total area is below our k. OK, if the yellow crap is 60%, how much of our area is left total? Thank you. It's not a trick 40. question. It's 40%. Very good. Now, what do we know about the shape of our normal curve? What's so special about it? It's all proportional. It's right. It's symmetrical. And the mean always sits right in the middle. So if there's 40% of our area left over, how much is in this tail? Very good. 20%. You got it. So obviously this one has the other 20%, right? So now let me ask you the, the grand total question. What percentage of the area is to the left of the K that we're looking for? Twenty percent. Well, that's if we're looking for this K. But what K am I looking 80%. for? 80%. Oh, yes. Okay. Either one would work, by the way. If you did 20%, that's fine. You just would have found the K on the low end. I'm looking for the K on the on the upper end because I want a positive K instead of a, a smaller K, but it's just, it's no big deal. It The math is easier to find the positive. Than the, they're both going to be a positive number, but this is going to, never mind. Either one would work. I'm going to do 80 because damn it, I'm in charge. Okay, so go to our SAS how to, right? Get this stuff, go back here, and I'm going to get me another one because I like to have different ones that I can work with. Okay, the inverse, we got to give it the area to the left, which we all now agree is 80%. We got to give it the mean, which is 250. Got to give it the standard standard deviation, which is 50. We run this bad boy, and blammo, there's my K, 292.081. Well, that's not really K. That's just the value, right? So this really isn't K. This is X, and this is uh two. What did I just say? 292, 282, 292, 292.081. That's the X value, because it's not K. Dummy, K is the difference, right? This is X, 292. So, so what's the dummy, difference? 
Dr. McBride, I want to make sure I'm following along and I'm sitting here trying to draw this out and I don't know why I'm pointing with my cursor. So 292.081 is from- the score. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to look at, I'm trying to look at it visually. It is from 300, well, not 300. It, um, okay, that's all right. I've confused myself. Okay, okay. so okay. let's go back to the scenario. The <laughs> scenario that we're dealing with is why is a random variable having a normal distribution with a mean of 250, standard deviation of 50? So let's just pretend that uh, 250 is a weight. So these are weights of something. So some things have an average weight of 250. Let's say adult men, right? So uh, a sample of adult men have an average weight of 50 and a standard deviation, uh, sorry, an average weight of 250 and a standard deviation of 50. And then we're basically asking the question, what K, right, what difference in weight do we have to have to capture 60% of the men? We want to we want to figure out a range that's going to have 60% of all men's weights in it. Well, by doing the inverse norm function, it gives us the X value that has the 80 below it. It basically gives us the weight. This says um, a man who weighs 292 pounds is heavier than 80% of the entire population of men because there's okay, 80% so below was, them. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was looking at it. So basically that was the upper end of our range. And now we're trying that our next step is to find the lower end of our range so we can determine the 60%. Well, we could, but we don't need to do that because now that we have the upper end of our range, we know what the distance here is. Because if this is 292 and the mean is 250, then what's this distance K? 42.081. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And that's all they wanted us to find was K. But if you did plug it in down here, yes, then if you took 42.081 away from it, or let's just say 42 to make the math easier, then this would be 208. So basically, the range of 208 to 292 captures 60% of all of our adult male weights. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so does this clear it up for everybody for, for D? Dr. McBride? Yes, Michael. It's uh, for me for the, the answer, are you looking for the uh, 292 or are you looking uh, for the difference though? Uh, 208 and the, the two. I'm looking, for, I'm looking for K. You're looking for K, that's all you're looking for. Yeah, so I'm looking for the 42. Got it. Yep. Yeah. Yes, Rachel, good job. Yes. Um, okay, Kofi, you're back. Yes, I'm back. I uh, would like you to look at 4.86 B and C. I'm just trying to check if my answers are all right. Okay, so visit the doctor. The stock blood pressure exceeds 150. A patient's considered to have high blood pressure, medication, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So B says if five measurements are taken, aha, so we're going to have to use the central limit theorem again here, because if five measurements are taken at various times of the day, what's the probability that the average, right, blood pressure reading will be less than 150? So we have to use the central limit theorem. We have to adjust the standard deviation accordingly. And by the way, Kofi, if you're doing this in uh, StatCrunch, it too can do uh, divided by SQRT of five. And that now becomes, you know, 130 divided by the square root of five. So you can, um, it, it, the programming works in, in, in both. Okay. Now for SAS, all right, we're going to, let's see, we're doing, what's our mean? Da, 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 da. Patients uh, exceeds 150, super high, medications, da, da, da. patients a uh, given day have a normal distribution with a mean of 160. All right, so there's my mean, 160. And a standard deviation of 20. All right, and then we want to know the probability that five measurements are less than 150, so we don't have to do any one minus. We want less than 150. Now, this would be less than 150 for one measurement, and I'm going to show you the difference you know, for the right answer, 
Here's 160 and then 20, but now we have to divide by the square root of five because we're doing all five measurements. And if we run this, so this first one, there's a 30% chance that just one measurement is less than 150. There's a 13% chance that the average of all five of them is below 150. And, and that should make sense to you guys, right? It should make sense that getting the average of all five to be less than 150 should be smaller than just one of them being less than 150, right? Because every probability is is a fraction, right? Every probability is a number less than one. And if you have to have all five things have that same characteristic, then you're doing multiple probabilities. So you're multiplying things that are less than one times each other. And every time you multiply something by something smaller than one, it gets smaller. So it makes sense that it should be smaller. All right, does that answer for you? Oh, sorry, you wanted B and C, did you say? Yes. Okay. So how many measurements would be required so that the probability of failing to detect um, that the patient has high blood pressure is at most 1%? Okay. So what the hell does it mean to, um, you know, fail to detect that the, the uh, person has high blood pressure? Well, if you, you got to read up here, right? If the systolic uh, blood pressure exceeds 150, the patient is considered to have high blood pressure and medication is prescribed. So what does it mean to fail to detect that the patient has high blood pressure? Basically just means that the reading is below 150. Yes. Yeah. So again, draw a picture kiddos. This is what makes this crap make sense is you always draw a simple picture and figure out what the hell am I doing? Here is my normal curve, right? Um, my average, what was the average? Kofi, for these? 150? No, 150 is what we're looking no, for. No, no. What's the average? I just don't want to be lazy and click back over here. Um, 160 and 20. All right. So the average is 160. Standard deviation is 20. Here's my cutoff. I'll even do it in another color because I'm that cool. We're basically looking for... Da, 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 da. 150 and we're looking for all of that area below it that's what we're looking for and the question is how do we change this right because what happens is as our sample sizes get bigger right so this is the curve when our sample is one because when our sample is one the standard deviation doesn't change so this is what happens when n equals one as our sample size increases then of course we divide by the square root of that sample size and if this if the standard deviation gets smaller then the curve just gets more compact, right? And this is still 160, 60. but now, you know, 150 is still over here because we're, you know, we're still on the same number line. So they still line up, right? That this distance is still the same because the same number line. But now you can see that this area is much smaller. And the idea is how, right, how, small does our standard deviation have to get how squished does this curve have to get so that this is only 0.01 or one percent okay well if i figure out the inverse norm i need to know in order to figure out the inverse norm you know to, to use the inverse norm function I need to know area to the left, which I have. I need to know mean, which I have. And then I need to know standard deviation, which I don't have because I don't know the sample score. I, I don't know the sample size. Those are all changing, right? Now, the whole thing is I need to solve for that third one. So I can't even use that inverse function because, damn it, I don't know what the standard deviation is because I don't know what the sample size is. But then I go, aha, wait, 
I have a way of figuring this out. I can go to the standard normal curve, right? The standard normal Z curve has a mean of zero, right? And a standard deviation of one. And I can find a corresponding Z score that has that same area. So if I go back to this and go back to my code and go to the inverse norm one, which is this one, and I want area to the left to be 1%, my mean is zero, my standard deviation is one, I run this, and that gives me the z-score. So there's my z-score. Negative 2.3265, you know, blah, 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 blah. Let's see if this works. Yep. Ooh. So there's my z-score. OK, great. That's a z-score. But that doesn't help me because I'm, I'm not looking for it on a standard normal curve. I'm looking for that same, that same relationship, that same distance. But in terms of normalized z's, I need it in terms of my function. But that's OK because I have a formula that relates all those together. I've got the formula that says z-score equals x minus the mean all over the standard deviation divided by square root of n. And remember right here, we're looking for an x. We want to know what is the value, right, that's going to basically get set up. Well, we know what the x is. Sorry, the x is 150. We're looking for n. n is the only thing we don't know. So we plug everything in, negative uh, 2.32635 equals 150 minus 160 all over 20 over the square root of n. We have all the bits and pieces except for n. And now you just need to solve for n algebraically. And I'm not going to do that for you. You're all big boys and girls. You can do that on your own. Now, I know this one's tough. This one is a, is a multi-step process. It's a lot of thinking going on here. What's important to take away from this question is, do you know how to use the inverse function? Do you understand what the inverse function does? Yes, I give it a probability. I give it a mean. I give it a standard deviation. It gives me a value. If we're on the, norm, on the standardized normal curve, that value it gives me is just called a z-score. It, it just means that we're going to give these things fancy names because we've standardized the curve and and now these these scores we call them z scores because z is is um comes from the german word for integer is why it's a z score like you cared but anyways so that's what those things are they're distances right they're standard deviations a z score of negative 2.3 means you're exactly 2.32653 standard deviations below the mean okay great what the hell does that mean well most people don't care how many standard deviations you are above or below something. Instead, they just want to know what your distance is. Well, then if you know how big your standard deviation is, you just take that and multiply it by your z-score. And then you get, oh, you're 40 points below the mean or you're 40 pounds below the mean or whatever it is that you're measuring, right? Well, in the case of this question, we want to know how far right how far down well we're 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 already know that we're just 10 okay so instead of answering the question how far down which is what you know the inverse function does it also depends on how wide the curve is and the wideness of the curve comes from the standard deviation and the standard deviation only changes based on our sample sizes so it was kind of a multi um step process where we couldn't just answer the question how far below we are because we already know that we're at 150 right the question was how big does the sample size have to be in order for the likelihood 
of basically the average of your sample being below 150. We want to tighten up that curve. We want to take so many measurements, right? We want you to, to take so many blood pressure measurements that at the end of the day, if you averaged all of them, the likelihood that um, you're, you're, you're basically going to um, fail to think that you have high blood pressure, meaning that all of your measurements come below 150, is only 1%, right? The idea of, of failing to see it is basically meaning that, well, sure, one of your readings might be 170 and you go, oh, God damn, my, my blood pressure is really high right now. But maybe that's just because you're, you know, you've been exercising or you're nervous about something or whatever. You know, the dog just barked and scared the crap out of you, whatever. But then the next time you take your blood pressure, it's down at, at 140 and you go, oh, I'm doing fine right? Well, that's only two measurements, dummy. Take more, right? Because they're going to bounce around the place. It's got a standard deviation for crying out loud. It's going to bounce around. The idea is how many of those measurements do you have to take so that when you average them all out, you're getting an accurate enough picture that if you do in fact have high blood pressure, i.e. your blood pressure on average is above 150, that the average of your sample is also going to be above 150 99% of the time. And only 1%, it's below 150. And that's a pretty good, you know, that's a pretty good error that, oh man, we would that we we'd have to like buy a lottery ticket if if we, you know, actually got an average below 150 when that only happens 1% of the time. And that's basically what a hypothesis test is, guys. Um, so when you move on to 810 and you have to, to learn about hypothesis tests, it's built on this concept, this idea that, you know, if you have a set mean and you have a standard deviation, what's the likelihood that you're going to get a measurement that's below a certain amount or above a certain amount or basically just different from what you thought it should be? And if that probability of that happening is small enough, then you assume that one of two things happen. Either you won the lottery and you just got a really weird sample that gave you a very rare example, that gave you a very rare, sorry, um, result, or your assumption of where the mean is, is wrong. And the curve has actually shifted. And if the curve has shifted, then you've basically kind of shown by your hypothesis test that you're gonna reject the null and you're gonna instead accept well you don't accept but you're going to support the alternative and that's what you guys are going to learn uh when you take 810 it's hypothesis test stuff but for okay, us for, do you yes. teach um math 810? 810? no they asked me to teach 810 oh. um next term but um i turned it down because i'm just too busy i'm sorry to say but i'll probably teach it the term after next term maybe i'll wait okay yeah if you want to wait thanks <laughs> thanks All right, any other homework questions? I see Rachel's hand up. Um, can you look at 4.94B for me? Yeah, of course. 4.94. So, oh, the correlation coefficient, yes. Yeah, um, I got the quantile MPA. plot, no problem. But... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a tr it's a tough one. You have to do the inset um, statistics option. Yep, I did that, but I can't figure out where the right I just can't figure out where the right thing is. Okay. Uh, let me get my file. 4.94. Load that. All right. Task and utilities. Remind me, is it under, where is the quantile plot? Is it under um, cluster analysis? Distribution analysis. Distribution analysis. All right. Why am I not seeing that? Unless I did the wrong thing, the no, QQ um, plot for toughness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the right thing. I just don't remember. Um, I don't remember what the menu structure is. Uh, let's see. Statistics, distribution analysis. All right. Statistics, distribution analysis. There we go. Okay. We got to add in toughness, and then. Under options, we can um, do a, a 
normal QQ plot and then add insert statistics and under insert to st inset statistics, you have to do the goodness of fit test. And if you run that, so here's your QQ plot. Here is your test, test statistic. So that is your. Um, I think I selected everything else, literally. <laughs> yeah. So there's your correlation coefficient and there's your p value. <laughs> got rid of the histogram i didn't need that right no no you can turn that off for sure yeah okay yeah Jeez. all right thank you of course anything else nobody else okay Good. Um, we'll end here since it's been an hour and 15 minutes anyways. I'm sure you guys are sick of listening to me and I know I'm sick of talking. Um, don't forget this week, all you have to do this week is the week five homework and then um, get me to sign off on your uh, research question that you want to use for part three. Whether you want to post that to the discussion board, which is what I'm hoping most of you will do, or email it to me directly. Either way, I don't care. Just make sure you run it by me so that you're picking something that is um, continuous, right? Because the whole, the whole, I mean, that's all I care about is that it's a continuous random variable. It would be nice if you could pick something that is at least tangentially related to what you're gonna do your dissertation on, if not, um, you know, strongly related. That would be great because it'd be nice for you to kind of start thinking about this in terms of something that matters rather than in terms of just a complete arbitrary made up uh, thing, which is basically what part three of the final project is. It becomes just a complete thought experiment, really. Some other things to think about. Um, there are, we're not meeting next week. Our, next, our, our meeting on Wednesday is our last meeting. So you wanna make sure that you have all your questions ready for then. Um, and so you wanna start taking a look at that final project so you can ask some questions. The only thing other that I would um, recommend is if you don't have access to StatCrunch, because you didn't want to pay the money and I don't blame you, um, make sure that you go out on Google and Google search for um, a normal calculator. See if you can find a normal calculator out there that will give you these graphs, because you need these graphs for part three of the project. Jackie. And uh, project question. Yeah. It's probably a quick one, but so for part two with the Excel, so I've been just putting all the, you know, the probabilities in for Excel. Mm -hmm. How do you want that into the report? Do you want that whole Excel file or do you want me to like incorporate that into a, I was starting to do a long report, like part one, part two, part three yeah, yeah. document. Yeah. Or do you want like a screenshot of it? Or what I would like, like the, yeah, the easiest thing would be is to just take a screenshot of your Excel spreadsheet showing the probabilities and the ranks. Okay. And just paste that into your Word document. Because if you okay. if you if you copy if you copy the Excel cells and paste it, it's gonna it's gonna paste it as an Excel object, and then you things might the formatting might get all screwed up because if it doesn't fit, all of a sudden it'll start wrapping your text and it'll get all ugly. So the easiest thing to do is just snip it, take a snippet of it and paste it, take another snip and paste it um, and do it that way. That's the easiest one. And, and of course, you know, if it's, if it's too big, you can snip it in pieces. Um, you can obviously, uh, you know, do all of the three different um, courts, you know, as their own snips and that kind of stuff, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, makes it look nice. Okay, and then one more question for the part you want on the discussion board. Can I just put my question there, like similar to how like 4.7 yeah. or 4.65, that's all you really want to see at this point? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just want to see the, the, the basically the okay. research question that you're going to, you know, that's going to give you um, an answer that's a continuous random variable. Yep. Anybody else? I saw somebody else looked like they had a question and then they went away. I was as it's Michael. 
Yeah. I was going to ask about the snippet uh, with uh, the former question or the previous question. Can we put it in a Word document or do you just want the snippet and then just post it into the discussion question? Oh, okay. So we were talking about two different things. So the, um, the discussion question is part three. In part three, they want you to um, basically um, right here, where is it? Uh, Describe the setting in your problem scenario and a short background information. So you're basically coming up with your own research question that would, um, if you ran the research and gathered the data, the data that you gathered would be considered a continuous random variable. So obviously it has to be um, some sort of measurement and not a count. What I want you to be posting to the discussion board, the 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 week five um, doctoral dialogue discussion board is just what your research question is. For instance, uh, one student in in, the, in, our, in one of my sections, I can't remember which section it is, is, is looking at gun violence and they're looking at, at ways to reduce gun violence. And they have, uh, you know, their question was, uh, I think it was a, a test score or something, which is a measurement. Somebody else had posted something um, that was talking about uh, heights or weights or something like that, you know, and those are all measurements. Anything like that is fine, right? So you just basically, you want to have a research question that's going to involve you collecting continuous data. And that's what you're going to post to the discussion board. The snippet that um, we were talking about is part two. And in part two, you have this large, well, it's not large. You have a, a set of data in Excel on a bunch of judges. And it's it's going to be easiest for you to calculate all of these probabilities just in Excel, because you can very easily set up a formula to do it. Um, for instance, I'll bring it up and show you. Um, final project part so two. Test score is not discrete. It's continuous. A test score is, continu is considered continuous because you could oh, technically like give ages. people well, you know, we normally report test scores discreetly, but we're technically measuring their intelligence, you know, or measuring things, um, you know, because I can give a, a fraction of a point, those kinds of things. So because you can you can give values in smaller and smaller increments, it's considered a continuous variable. So this is the data. Um, that we're looking at for part two and you need to fill in all of this stuff. Well, if you're trying to figure out the probability of an appeal, that's simply just the number of appeals over the total number of cases that they um, adjudicated. So this is just gonna equal this cell divided by that cell and that's probability. And you can sit there and make it a percentage and give it two decimal places and then do this. Just drag it down and Excel goes beep and does them all for you. And then the next one is probability of a reversal. Well, that's just simply going to equal number of reversals divided by cases adjudicated. And again, I'm gonna turn it into a percentage. I'm gonna give myself two decimal places of accuracy because I'm just that cool. And drag and drop and blah, 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 there they all are, okay? And then the last one is conditional probability of a reversal given an appeal. Well, remember, conditional probability is the probability that something happens given that something else has happened. So that's simply just the number of reversals, right? Because we want to know the, the probability of a reversal given that they've already had an appeal. So instead of reversals divided by total, it's reverses over appealed. So this is simply just equals this divided by this, and again, percentage, two decimals, and zing. And now that I have all of this data, I can now rank my judges. I can, I can make the decision as to what I feel is the, the worst thing that can happen, you know, that a judge can do. Is it, is it, is it worse that the judge has a, a case go up for appeals? Is it worse that a judge has a case get reversed or is it worse that a judge gets something reversed given that it went to appeals, right? Which of those three is going to give me, you know, pause the most, is going to, you know, have me rank my judges. 
And so I'm going to make a decision. And whatever my decision is, then I'm going to rank my judges where I'm going to go, okay, this guy's the worst, right? So he's, he, or he's the best, he's one. And, and then and she's the second best, so she's two, right? And then she's third best, you know, and I'm just going to number them. And, you know, there can be more than one answer for these ranks as long as you um, justify uh, well, why you came up with them. Now, this, this file is all of the judges put together. You've got three separate courts and you're going to do them, you know, for three separate courts. And then I think it also then asks you to do it um, all together as well but anyways it's easier to do that work in excel so what i was saying is once you've done the work in excel then it'd be better to take a screen capture of this rather than copying it because if you copy it um, it's going to paste it into word and it's going to it, it it looks weird it, it it if it doesn't fit then all of a sudden you know you're going to get things are going to wrap around and it's going to be all honk wonky. And so instead you just take this and paste that, you know, into your word document and go from there. So that's what you're we talking about. Dr. McBride, you can do it and save it as an image without doing the screen capture. You are correct. You can do it that way as well. Yes, you are absolutely correct. You can just do this, which is probably even the cleaner way of doing it and do uh, control C and then in your Word document, you can come down here and do paste special and paste it as a picture or a bitmap. You can just do pictures, fine. Or when you when you right click also, you can select the image uh, option under paste. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. I do it all the time. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably the cleaner way of doing it than doing a snippet because then you get all of the cells and you get all of their you know little lines around them and all that and it comes out being all nice and pretty so thank you cecily that was a good um, good reminder and i'm on part four on that it's got the appealed and reversed in the three course so that intersection so that you can take both those numbers to divide by the totals of the that individual court um, no, I think that? part four. Am I reading that wrong? Yeah, part four is. Um, I I read part four as meaning the probability of it being appealed given, or the probability of it being reversed given that it's appealed, because it has to be both, reverse right? Reverse over appeal. Exactly, and it has to be appealed before it can okay. be reversed. So in order for something to be reversed, it has to already be appealed. Right. Okay. Oh, wait, no, sorry. This is probability right. of reversal given an appeal. So yeah. it says probability of cases being appealed. Oh, so probability of curse of cases being appealed and reversed. Um, appealed and reversed. Is that you have to add the appeal and the reverse number over the total of that oh, 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 common oh. police court no, no. or over what, that what, domestic? What four is saying is they want you to do the probability of cases being appealed and probability of cases being reversed in the three courts. So not just individually for by each judge, judge. But by so the they total. want to do these so th you need to basically do it for the, the the totals down here so for instance probability of just a case in general being appealed in the common pleas court is simply going to equal the total number of appeals divided by the total cases seen in that court okay. so that's what that 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 question just that's means what I did. Okay. yeah so in, in addition to doing it for the, the individual cases that were reversed exactly that yep exactly okay. so it just means that they want you to do it for all the individual judges but they also want you to do it for each of the three courts right so there's this okay. grand total for this court and then there's this grand total for this court and then this grand total for this court okay i don't that's what it meant sometimes that like you said with the, the reading of it it's like yes it can be a little confusing yeah. yeah totally I'm glad you asked that because I'm sure other people would have been like, what the hell does this mean? Yeah, so that's that's those four questions and then and then you rank them. And that's everything you have to do for part two. It's a pretty simple part. Part two is the easiest part of the project. In my opinion. And I think most students agree. We have to do some kind of explanation to why like all I want you to do it is explain repair reports. Somewhere. Well, all I want you to do for a repair for prepare report, all you want to do is point out anything that is out of the ordinary, right? So if there's a particular judge 
that has percentages higher than everybody else, you'd want to point that out. If one of the courts seemed to be different from all the others, you know, like a probability of an appeal was 10%, 10%, and all of a sudden 20% for the one of the courts. You're like, oh, wow, you know, you would, you would point that out. Um, so that's the, the discussing part. And then, of course, you want to discuss how and why you rank them the way you rank them. You know, I, I chose to use this measurement for my ranking because, you know, justify why. Why did you feel that that was the right measurement to use to um, rank your, your judges? And that's really all the write-up part is. And we're basically looking for outliers and explaining them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really what you always do in any kind of report, right? You either explain, you, you identify and explain outliers, or you point out that there are none, right? Because there's really only two things that we ever care about, we as in statisticians, when we're looking at a large set of data. We want to look at the outliers, the weird things, right? The things that don't act like everybody else, or we want to know if everything acts the same. So if it's very homogenous, then we report it's very homogenous. Everything's the same. There's no outliers. They all just, you know, act the same way. And if it's not homogenous, then we point out those outliers. You know, the mean is this, but these guys over here, they're really weird. They're way off. You know, they're way bigger or they're a lot smaller or whatever it happens to be. Yeah, you always want to point out the oddities, the outliers. Anything else? All right. Great class as always, guys. Thanks for showing up. And I will see the vast majority of you on Wednesday. Take care, Dr. McBride. Thanks, you too. Good night, Thanks. everybody. Thanks.